Welcome to this special presentation of Investing in Psychedelics, brought to you by the Canadian Securities Exchange in partnership with CFN Media. It's James Black here from the Canadian Securities Exchange, and welcome and thank you for making it to Investing in Psychedelics, a proud presentation of the CSE, Canadian Securities Exchange, and CFN Media. So without further ado, um, I won't have the fortunate uh, task of talking to you today and moderating. That's actually my colleague, Anna Sarin. Well, now welcome into the room to uh, uh, engage with the proceedings for this session, which is psychedelics and the capital markets. Anna? Hi, James. Thank you so much for the intro. Uh, this is a bit of a new experience for us. We're not running on stage. We're, uh, we're logging in on time. Thank you so much to everyone that uh, is participating. Um, Sorry, just a sec here, I have a little back feed. Make sure I turn that off. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Anna Saren. I'm Director of Listings Development with the Canadian Securities Exchange. Uh, today we are doing a presentation on psychedelics uh, and investing in that sector. This, this event got much bigger than we had anticipated. Um, you know, the registrations coming through were huge. The participants were many, many companies that are coming to market. And it was a true pleasure to get to know um, everyone that you'll be hearing from today. There's some really amazing work that's being done out there. And just to touch on, you know, when we're having this discussion, you know, it's June 17th, 2020. We've had an interesting few months as a society as a whole. Um, and, you know, a lot of the work that's being done in the psychedelic sector is really a focus on mental well-being, mental illnesses. Um, you know, so it, I think it's very timely that we're starting to have this dialogue and see it come to the capital markets. Uh, I'd like to very much thank our partner in this event, which is CFN Media. Thank you very much to Frank Lane and your group. Sorry, I still have some noise coming through here. Just turn that off. Um, so thank you very much to Frank uh, and CFN Media. CFN Media is a media company in leading digital agency and media network serving highly regulated emerging industries across the globe, including legal cannabis, CBD, and psychedelics. CFN Media's parent company is CFN Enterprise Inc. So again, thank you so much to the CFN team for your participation and help in putting this huge event together. Um, you can go to the CSE YouTube page, which has a psychedelics playlist. We've been launching videos for the past month, including our CEO, uh, a clip from Bruce Linton, uh, Dr. Dennis McKenna, Dr. Roger McIntyre, and Dr. Nikos Apostolopoulos. I hope I said it okay, Dr. Nikos. Um, so again, thank you everyone for your participation. Our first panel today uh, is going to be investing in psychedelics and how they're coming to the capital market. So um, I'd like to introduce my colleagues who are joining me. I have um, Bill O'Hara, who is CFA and Managing Director of Haywood Securities. Hi, Bill. Thank you. Hi, Anna. How are you? Thanks for... Uh... I'm you're welcome. I'm good, thank you. Um, I'd also like to welcome um, Henri Sancasia with uh, TSF, he's founding partner. I'd like to introduce Josh Lawler with Zuber Lawler and Aaron Weaver with Atai Life Sciences, who's senior general counsel. Uh, so thank you so much everyone for joining me today. Um, and, you know, as, as mentioned, we've had a few conversations leading up to this. It's obviously been of interest to all of us as this comes to capital market. So I really want to guide this discussion around how it is coming to us and what we're going to see, um, the types of financings, whether companies should be public or not. Uh, but before we dive into all, the, all of that, I'd love for you all to introduce yourself. So, uh, Bill, why don't we start with you? Tell us about yourself and why you're in this sector. Right, thanks, Anna. Um, so I'm a managing director at Hewitt Securities, and if I could just give uh, a few seconds here to um, give a disclaimer, which I'm sure everybody's used to when they hear presentations. Um, um, Hewitt is a Canadian-based independent full-service investment firm and a member of the Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Uh, the views of this presentation are expressly cautioned to seek advice of a registered investment advisor and other professionals as applicable. Uh, Haywood makes no guarantee, representation, or warranty expressed or implied as to the accuracy of the information in this presentation or its completeness. And finally, the views expressed are mine and not necessarily Haywood Securities. Now, Haywood Securities is Canada's largest independently owned um, brokerage firm, full service. We have $8 billion in our management and we have a corporate um, an invest institutional side that does corporate finance, sales and trading and research. Um, we mainly focus on resources, mining is, and oil and gas, but 
because of the technicality, we have special situations group. And over time, that ranges from blockchain, crypto, um, cannabis, and now psilocybin and uh, psychedelics. And the evolution of this for me came from hearing several stories and being um, amazed at the potential of the plant and what it can do because I only recognized it as a psychedelic drug from the 60s as such and didn't realize the medicinal properties. And when I started to investigate further, it became apparent that this is something that um, that needs to be investigated as a as a global um community and so uh, it's, it's, we're at the forefront of that now and it's very exciting and that that created uh, a new industry in front of us and it's something that i wanted to be a part of wonderful thank you bill um why don't we go next to yourself aaron weaver your senior general counsel with the thai life sciences tell us about yourself and how you're a part of this sector yeah, Aaron Weaver, I'm a Senior General Counsel at Atai Life Sciences. I'm also responsible for leading fundraising at Atai also. I came into the area through a, a matter of a deep personal connection. It was watching someone close to me who sort of experienced the failures in the prevailing standard of care, uh, SSRIs, SNRIs, um, as being sort of treatments of last resort that uh, continually failed and various experiences through um, poor responses to toxicity with some of those substances and then just uh, watching that person actually spiral into um, sort of a state of health that was actually worse than when they'd actually entered that treatment paradigm. Uh, it led me into looking deeply at a number of the alternate therapies. Um, we didn't actually pursue any of those for um, some of the reasons about well, connected with the uh, health indications that person had experienced, but it did show me the tremendous therapeutic promise that they had. And during that uh, during that journey, I was I met a number of the people who were starting the Thai Life Sciences and got involved with it at an early stage because I did see the sort of the tremendous potential that um, a platform that they were building could really how it could bring change to the world. Uh, a little bit about a Thai. A Thai is a mental health company that invests and in, provides an operational backbone around drug development and digital therapeutic companies. Most of those predominantly focused within the psychedelic space. We do have some companies that are non-psychedelic in nature, but they are predominantly abandoned um, compounds developed by pharmaceutical companies. We believe that we have an approach that can help accelerate uh, patient access to uh, these much needed drugs. And so we develop compounds and therapies within areas of significant unmet medical need. Wonderful. Um, Henri, why don't you tell us about yourself and your fund? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, I'm Henri St. Cassier. I'm a founding partner at the Conscious Funds. We are an early stage to um, C to Series A venture capital funds, and we're focused entirely on the psychedelic medicine space. I got into this industry with my partner, Richard. Um, from two angles really. First, um, I've always used psychedelic substances. I've studied them for a long time. Um, and both he and I have been running operating companies um, in the cannabis sector. And we were looking for a better market, something more sophisticated, um, something with a lot more potential. Um, and we've watched this sector grow enormously over the last three to six months. Um, and we're very proud to be a part of such a groundbreaking sector and space. Thank you, Omri. And Josh, last but not least, please tell us about yourself and how you're involved in this sector. You're a securities lawyer, correct? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you, Aaron. I'm a partner with Zuber, Lawler, and Del Duca in the United States. Uh, we have offices in LA, New York, Chicago, Silicon Valley. We handle uh, complex commercial transactions, mergers and acquisitions, finance. We've been extremely involved in uh, new and emerging technologies, uh, including uh, cannabis, uh, where we represent many of the larger companies in their larger transactions and have, uh, amongst other things, cross-listed uh, folks from CSE to OTCQB and QX. Um, I have to give a little bit of a shout out to Bill, who warmed the cockles of my heart by starting with a disclaimer. And I will add, nothing I say is intended to be legal advice and should get your own counsel. And uh, also, actually, to uh, to Henri, who warmed the cockles of my house, part by saying that, in fact, he was a user of psychedelics, which is great. Um, <laughs> my own experience, uh, I've had uh, experience uh, with people with depression. 
uh, and uh, have uh, an idea of what some of these therapies can do. Uh, so on top of uh, just being uh, very interested in the space from a business and a legal perspective, uh, I definitely am uh, an advocate in terms of, uh, you know, helping, helping people. Thank you so much. And, you know, I think that's the one thing that I discovered, too, as I went down this path with all of you is to find out, um, you know, how much benefit this the work that's being done around it really is there to um, aid and treat a lot of addiction issues and mental health issues, which is something that we definitely need at this point um, and, and very much acts as an alternative kind of to the traditional treatment therapies that we've provided. And we'll get more into that as the day goes on. Um, so why don't we start off having this conversation really around the capital markets all of you have had experience with both the private companies in the space and the public companies in the space I'm, I'm gonna kind of ask you all to maybe give your input on you know are you seeing more of the private are you seeing them more come to the capital markets should they be coming to the capital markets what kind of financings we're seeing so Bill I'm actually gonna jump in with you here and, and maybe you can just tell us your experience you know obviously having raised money from you know, the capital market side, you're probably really seeing both, you know, the private and the public. What, what's what been your view on that? Yeah, certainly um, because it's such a new space, the companies that are created are largely private, uh, basically all private. And so they get their early funding from friends and family and then institutions or high net worth individuals, family offices that believe in the space as a, as a whole, because the fundamentals at this stage are still rather vague. and. Um, you know, the idea is to progress from a private company as you need more capital, you need to access more um, means of capital. So the public markets are a great way to do that. So a lot of times, um, you know, the companies will then uh, list on an exchange and then you'll see deals being done on the exchange where it's open to a, a bigger retail audience. And that just provides them uh, more access uh, to people that they couldn't get through their friends and family uh, database and, and uh, network. And um, at the moment, we've seen a handful of companies go public from the private stage, and they've done well. Um, and we're seeing subsequent deals being done in the market post they're going public. So there's a lot of interest, and there's a lot on the come uh, with these private companies. There's a lot in the hopper, if you will, um, as they are you know, getting aligned to go public. And um, it's a natural progression for this type of uh, space. And do you think that... Um that there potentially it, it might be a value for people to look at kind of the public market side of thing, similar to other sectors where they're going to have to go back to market more than once to raise capital as they go through either testing or growth. Do you think that it's a good suiting for them to come to the capital markets? Bill, are you there? Uh -oh. I think we lost Bill. Um, you know what, uh, Josh? Why don't Why don't we have you kind of discuss a little bit about the discussion around what are these companies going to have to look at if they want to go public? Sure, uh, happy to do so. So, you know, from that perspective, there's nothing particularly different from the psychedelic uh, sector. You know, they need to be able to define their financials with a level of accuracy. They need to be able to define their business model and their team. And obviously, they need to have people who have not been dinged previously with securities law and fraud violations, which may seem obvious, but uh, you'd be surprised who, who tries. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that we always try to advise clients on before they go public is to really look hard at the post, uh, uh oh, <laughs> look hard at the, uh, the post uh, transaction obligations and the continued reporting and the continued investor relations, because that stuff is actually really make or break. Um, it, it's not that hard to go public, especially if you're gonna do something like reverse merging into a shell. Um, it's kind of hard to stay public. Yeah, which I think is a really good point that, um, you know, lots of emerging sectors have have gone through. Um, I think, you know, creating that disclosure, when you go public, you're required with a lot of disclosure requirements, um, you know, and that will aid you kind of going forward. But, but it is, you know, a secondary um, element to your company. So not only are you managing your operations or your research and development, but you're also managing, you know, being a public entity. Um, perhaps we could jump to uh, both yourself, Aaron and Omri, and talk about um, both of you have, obviously this is what you do for a living is your due diligence around these companies, whether private or public. Can you talk to us a little bit, and Aaron, I'll let you start, but talk to us a little bit about how the due diligence um, is maybe different than due diligence you've done in the past. I know one of your roles with the TAI is 
um, on the financing side. So you look at tons of deals. How do you approach this differently than you might another sector? Uh, I, I think predominantly we look to a, a series of validating factors, um, one of which is, you know, has there been significant scientific inquiry around the asset? Uh, a lot of our, a lot of the compounds we worked on have spun out of um, significant um, academic institutions, NYU, uh, relationships with Imperial, uh, Imperial College. And then it is, we have a series of neuropharmacologists and neuroscientists that work with us who try to then really understand the core pharmacology of the compound that we work with. And then it is really looking at, a lot of these compounds come with um, significant observational uh, data and evidence. And then there's also sort of open label studies around a number of the compounds. So a lot of it is framed round looking at developing a strong scientific understanding of the asset. Um, the financial, on the financial side, I mean, a lot of these are pre-revenue assets. So it's just really looking at the expense base and then really assessing the cap structure there afterwards. But um, in, as a platform, Atai sort of then broadly offers a degree of operational support for them to sort of really build that out in terms of clinical trials and regulatory engagement. So we sort of, we do the diligence to see whether there is a matter of strong fit within our platform. Are you finding that a lot of these companies, um, you know, have some some historical data to kind of back up what they're attempting to do as far as clinical trials or re research and development? I mean, obviously, this is new to capital markets. This isn't a new sector, though. So um, are you dealing with people who have been working on these studies for years and you have that background or is this all fairly new? Some of them have been working on these compounds for decades and uh, they have such a strong understanding of the way they work and the, the core promise, uh, the core sort of therapeutic promise that they have to a number of patients that, uh, you know, it does make it somewhat of an easy decision for us at times to invest into things just because the science is really, really there, but the, um, but the funding environment hasn't caught up to that. Right. And and Amri, maybe you can jump in here because uh, you have an interesting start to how you built this fund out. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that um, or the PG version <laughs> of why you switched to the psychedelic sector and part of your due diligence process. So we were originally set up to look at cannabis and hemp transactions. We looked at close to 900 um, and we got jaded pretty quickly with what we were finding, copycat operations badly conceived RTOs, you know, a whole range of cannabis type sins that actually made it very difficult, even for a fund like us. And we've got very similar set up to um, Aaron's in terms of the kind of level of due diligence that we're able to do. We were sifting lots of transactions and finding very little of interest. And we, there just wasn't the same excitement that we saw in the psychedelic space as well. There was a real lack of passion in cannabis. There was a lot of, you know, money focus. Um, in psychedelics, it's very different. Um, we pivoted pretty early on. Um, we were impressed by the quality of teams. There was this genuine passion. Everybody on this panel has described a personal connection to depression or mental health or addiction or some actual connection and vesting into the space and that I think is actually an important part of the due diligence process is that are the founders truly interested in psychedelic or plant medicine or are they seeing the chance for a quick RTO and you know a quick profit and if if there isn't that depth of relationship between plant medicine and the founders you've got a problem and in terms of overall due diligence I think you can categorize it You've got classic kind of venture type due diligence that would apply to any company. Is it a strong team? Are you dealing with a sociopath or somebody that you can work with over seven or eight years? Are their projections reasonable? Um, is the, and then you've got sort of psychedelic specific stuff. So you've got to do a lot of very heavy science checks, checks on IP and claims. Um, and then you're also looking at the overall funding environment so everything is kind of hyper compressed in psychedelics they're moving we've looked at virtually every company in the space probably 70 or 80 or, or already typically seed series a go public they're all compressed um particularly in the smaller companies they're all compressed together and you've got to look at the structure of the deal 
look at their funding requirements over you know a period of several years if they go public will they be able to go back into the market if they remain private is there enough capital for example to do clinical trials you've got to look at kind of three areas classic vc psychedelic spe specific stuff and then a lot of stuff around the transaction and the funding and if you get through all that you can start to do comparable um checks and i think that's very important it's a new space there isn't data yet um but there is enough already that you can look at you know two companies in drug discovery how do they, how do they compare two clinic companies two companies of similar age look for those kind of comparable parables and hopefully once you've done all of that you will have an idea of how you can rank deals and how you know where your money is best placed because everything looks great in psychedelics it's more about what is the most sensible use of your money in a particular sequence well uh, you know that it to be honest that sounds a bit daunting for a retail investor that wants to get into the sector but i think you made up a few or you brought up a few very uh, important valid points you know to take a look at the not made up <laughs> Um, you know, just to take a look at the team, take a look at the transaction, um, and and either upon bring it upon yourself to do some research on on the sector and the science behind it, um, or find people that you can trust to provide you with that information. Um, and that kind of brings up a good point for me for all of you. Actually, it's too bad that um, obviously Bill is having technical issues, um, and definitely wanted his input on this. But I know you can all speak to this. How do we create valuations for these companies? How do we how do we evaluate some when most most of them are just in the test or clinical phase um, or creating, you know, developing something that will be a future use should there ever be a recreational play. How, how do we how do we start with valuations? Josh, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. And I, I apologize for the collie in the background. So that's what it is. Uh, Gardner would show up. So, you know, I think what, what I'm re mentioned, the key word is plant medicine. Um, you have to understand that compared to cannabis, this is not a recreational CPM kind of company, which a lot of the cannabis companies that went public are. So you're really much better off looking at, you know, a developmental stage pharmaceutical company for a comparison, recognizing that there's kind of this overlay of legality in respect to certain, but not all of the hallucinogenics uh, and psychedelics. I mean, in the United States, for instance, Ketamine is a great example of one that's not illegal and ketamine clinics are growing uh, as a business. Um, so, you know, when you when you value things, size of market is going to be something. Uh, again, you're looking at team. The science becomes very important, being able to evaluate the science um, and possibly how far they are into clinical trials, uh, if at all. Um, so, you know, it, it becomes a cost benefit analysis. But at the end of the day, um, the valuation is what the market will bear. Um, and there's no there's no getting around that either. Uh, so, you know, when you are public and you've got retail investors involved and there's a hype cycle uh, along with the kind of more um, bedrock business concepts, uh, that becomes potentially uh, a difficult situation um, or, or not. It's, you know, that's that's why, why I'm in law and not in investment advising. It's, it helps too. Now, just out of curious, uh, curiosity, Josh, you obviously look at these companies that they're as they're preparing to go public, and evaluation is a very important step, you know, down that path. Um, do you see from what you've seen so far, and you might all be able to step in here, um, is there a lot of funding that's happening, seed rounds that are happening before they're looking at the go public process? You would imagine that if some of these test trials have been around for a while, there should be a lot of capital that has come in the door before they look at going public. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, the going public process itself is not inexpensive. Uh, so just to, to do that, you've got to have a level of funding behind you. But you know, as was mentioned, uh, some of these um, compounds have been under research for decades. Um, so, you know, there's there's potentially quite a bit behind them. And I would suggest that the ones that are more advanced now and are already publicly listed are extensions of, you know, people who've been working on projects for, for quite some period of time. Uh, so, yeah, definitely there's, there's a level of establishment there. 
Wonderful. Bill, you, you showed up right at the exact moment. I was just saying I missed you for this question. Um, you know, obviously, we're all living in a world right now where we're having to deal with at-home dialogues like this. So um, I'm sure everyone is very patient with uh, dogs and, and bad Wi-Fi. But uh, Bill, welcome back. We were just diving into this conversation around how we evaluate these companies, which I know um, you definitely have some thoughts on. So tell us your thought on that. <laughs> Great uh, question. It's very difficult. I think um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an art more than a science at this stage of these companies. Um, and, you know, there's no real scientific method. It's, a, it's an art, uh, like I said, and a lot of times um, it's what the market will bear. And, and um, really, that's what it comes down to. I mean, you can have a team. How do you value a science team versus another science team? Um, it's practically impossible. You can you can value it based on the stage of clinical development that they're at. If we're talking about drug development, if we're talking about clinics. You have revenues which will create earnings. You can you know trade them on an earnings multiple, um, or you know forecast or potential growth and the opportunities and the size of the market that they're that they're um, uh, addressing. So again, I really wanted to say that it's it's um, it's a scarcity factor with the number of companies that are public. So. That creates an artificial lift to the, to the stocks. Um, it's a art more than a science, and it's really what the market will pay. And that, it sounds ridiculous, but that's that's what it is. I mean, I have no other reason or ability to to market these things or value them. So, Bill, um, one thing that we saw in the cannabis space, and we'll dive into you know you know both sides of that coin in a minute, but. Um, one thing we saw in the cannabis space was the retail market really, really liked it in, in the capital markets. And sometimes um, valuations were created not necessarily based on fundamentals. Do you think that that there's the potential for this sector to enter into a similar um, environment? Sure. And I think that's what's happening at the moment because, again, it's so new that the companies that are, that are traded now are traded on, again, it's the only ones you can trade, so it's a scarcity factor. But you know, when when the market demands forecasts, they're just guesses. They're not. Uh, you can't you can't guarantee that these are going to work out in the future. And um, we're, we're dealing with the wild west, basically. They're brand new. We don't know how people would uh, will um, receive them. We don't know how long it will take for a drug to develop. Um, certainly, those types of companies require a lot of capital. Are not as exciting as companies that continue to make increased uh, customers to their clinics kind of thing. So yes, you'll see that that come into play, but it's only because it's the Wild West and people don't really know what to expect uh, in the market at the moment. Um, but well, and I think you brought up a really good point there. Sorry, Aaron, I'll, I'll jump to you in a second. I think the really important part there is that when it is um, such early stage, that is when professionals like yourselves are incredibly important in these sectors because due diligence is the number one. Once you get to a senior stock, the due diligence has been built in for you by fund managers and money managers and institutions. Um, whereas right now we're in a state where if you want to be a retail investor in this space, you need to apply um, you know, strong due diligence practices to investing in these companies. Um, Aaron, sorry to cut you off. Jump in there. Yeah, I, we I, at a tie. We have a very structured way in which we effectively see value. Uh, a lot of that is based on sort of looking at the core epidemiology of the target indication which the compound is looking to treat. So we can then sort of start to understand um, the the disease prevalence and then sort of calculate. Okay. It, whether it's psilocybin or ketamine or ibogaine, what are the penetration rates into that patient uh, patient population? What are the costing assumptions and having core understandings of the way that health insurers will engage, what patients are actually willing to pay? We can then start to financially model all that out and then get an understanding of the cost of how, um, how much it actually takes to put a drug through an approval process. And if you look at maps at the moment who are... Um, coming very, very close to having a phase three approval, an MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. I mean, they've raised more than $80 million to effectively support those trials. So we can then start to back out what we understand would be a cost base. Plus, we have uh, a lot of estimates and uh, we understand what the, the core expense base would be for just conventionally developing a neuropsychiatric asset. So I think that there is a swath of data out there to effectively support fundamental analysis on doing this. It's just that um, people need to know where to find it and they need to know that there are structured approaches for doing this. 
Absolutely. Henri, any final thoughts there? Um, <clears throat> when Bill said it's an art, I think he's very, he was very right, but it's not abstract art. It, there are ways of finding comparables. So if you look at, if you took a hypothetical example of a drug or a, a psychedelic program that was addressing post-operative pain, for example, you could look at similar exits for analgesics. You could get an idea of what other companies had spent on their trials, um, as Aaron said. Um, and you can start to estimate potential exits. And then at the market end of it, if you look at enough transactions that are going on in psychedelics, you can say to yourself, okay, this company has got an excessive valuation at seed, it's at 60 million, everybody else is at 20. You, between those two sets of parameters around exits and kind of later stages around the market right now, you can get kind of bands. And if a company is outside those bands, it's an outlier unless there's a very strong justification for it you are probably as an investor taking an excessive risk. Henri, you know, you bring up a, an interesting point. You've all kind of touched on this a little bit. There's an incredible amount of due diligence that you and your teams go through when you're looking at these companies. There's an incredible amount of technical data to go through. Um, you know, is I wonder how this is going to play out as far as, are we gonna see maybe more funds in this space than individual investment opportunities? In the cannabis space, we just saw so many individual investment opportunities. Do you think this might be a bit more of a life science fund play? Um, I can attempt that. Um, yeah. <laughs> there are a handful of funds. We're one of them. I'd like to think we're the most active, but um, there are others. Um, I think you may see fewer retail investors that are just taking a gamble. It is a more sophisticated space. It doesn't have the um, recreational ends um, of the market, as Josh pointed out. So it, this is squarely about medicine, it's mental health, it's addiction, it's there are wellness elements, but it, there's no recreational market. So you're not gonna see everybody pouring into it like you have in cannabis you will probably see a lower number of more sophisticated investors taking higher individual gambles whether you'll see a whole rack of funds i don't know it takes a very it took us for example nearly 14 months to get compliance clearance to operate as a fund we had to go through european regulators wow. and we had to teach them what psychedelic medicine was and that took a very long time and then you're getting over so because the market's moving so quickly i think if you wanted to set up a fund now by the time you've got permission to operate you might be kind of too late but i think there will be a lot of very sophisticated investors that come in with bigger checks and back companies more heavily as opposed to lots of smaller retail investors well, I was yeah. going to say, most of the financings I've seen have been fairly large numbers. We're not seeing small financings that are happening. I mean, we've, you know, it's 20 million seems to be kind of the baseline for these financings. Would you agree? Yeah. And one thing just to get out there is you're not going to have the constellation canopy growth moment in psychedelics that you had in cannabis, um, which was a recreationally oriented thing. And that, that really from the US perspective, got a lot of notice. It's like, oh my gosh, there's this giant valuation that's just been ascribed to this Canadian cannabis company. And you know, cannabis is legal in Canada, never mind the fact that there are regulations that significantly dampen uh, sales. That's kind of all the retail investors saw. And you know, Constellation is it's beer. I mean, that's what people saw is a beer company invested in a cannabis company and they want in. This is much more pharmaceutical and you know, could there be some kind of a blockbuster deal where a Pfizer or Merck or, you know, AstraZeneca or, you know, over in England decides to purchase a, a compound? Absolutely. Is that going to attack, you know, create the same kind of a stir that that Constellation deal? No chance. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, it's the Wild West, but I don't think it's going to quite explode the way that the cannabis market did and then you know, subsequently fall, of course, as we've all seen 
Well, the cannabis market, I mean, the bottom line with the cannabis market is it, it just it became recreationally legal in a lot more jurisdictions than we might see in the psychedelic space anytime mm -hmm. soon. It's definitely got a few spots that are growing. Um, but I think, yeah, just on, on that general note, I mean, in the U.S., Josh, the, the, the legal cannabis sector is just so massive. I mean, you know, I, I heard that the legal cannabis sector in, um, in California is bigger than Canada, you know, across the board. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, that's just by numbers, um, you know, a big portion of it. Are we going to see institutional guys come into this play or is it going to be kind of retail and, and, and smaller funds? Anyone can jump in there. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk from experience here. Yeah, <laughs> there are, I mean, coming out of the pandemic um, and just more broadly, the, the issue of mental health has sort of had a spotlight uh, placed on it at the moment. And this is like probably one of the more novel spaces within mental health innovation at the moment. That has catalyzed um, players such as, you know, the world's largest asset managers, BlackRock, setting aside money to specifically invest within novel mental health therapies. I think the institutions are definitely on board with this, and that is because this is probably a public health issue. Henri? Yeah, you don't have the, you know, in cannabis, there were lots of reasons why institutions, certain types of investors, either because of their mandates or because of their, you know, the beliefs of the principle or stigma or proceeds of crime laws. There were any number of reasons why institutions and others couldn't participate in cannabis and actually that left the vacuum for the smaller retail investors i think those two factors are interlinked now in psychedelic medicine most companies don't require legal changes there is no recreational kind of bent in the market these are medical companies that happen to be using psychedelic compounds that a clinic that just uses psychedelic compounds it's a drug discovery company that happens to use those compounds as an input and that means there's far fewer blocks on institutions getting involved and they clearly already are you can see it from the breakdown of investors in the larger companies you can see it in the transactions that are happening in the venture space and the early stage stuff there are institutions going in um, and I think you'll see more and more of them over time. Well, and I think, you know, as far as the retail sector is concerned, the one thing that we are seeing a shift in in our, you know, retail investors and, and you know, I, I have to thank the cannabis sector because I think it finally brought that next generation of investor to the table. Um, and I'm very personally thankful for that. You know, we needed some fresh blood um, and uh, we needed kind of that excitement and the new investor to come in and look at these companies in a different way. You know, they're not having to go to CDAR for a press release. You know, they're able to go to Twitter. They're able to go to the website. They're able to get on a webinar directly with the CEO and have those conversations. So investing, especially in the small cap space, has definitely transformed. Um, but also they're a more conscious investor. They're, they're interested in funds that are doing better for us as a society. And this very much, I I think will embody that in in a very deep rooted way. So I think, you know, the the investor coming to this market um, has has a little bit more um, emphasis on on what it will be doing as opposed to a recreational pay on a, a play on a recreational drug. Um, Bill, just a question for you. We have tons of questions coming in, by the way, guys. I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them. So I'll make sure I leave us lots of time for that. Um, but Bill, maybe you could just touch on, there's two things I wanted to ask you. Um, firstly, what is the sentiment of your of your clients? I know that you still manage lots of clients. Are they are they dying for these deals to come to market? Are they asking you about them? What What's the interest level? Um, so my client base is both institutional and, and retail high net worth. And so, you know, there was an initial clamoring for what's the deals that are happening in the space. People always want to know what's what's going on. Um, but now we've seen some public ones come out and they did really, really, really well. And so they created more of a demand for, you know, development of these of these companies and financings of the private companies. But now we're starting to sort of see sort of a, you know, I don't want to say we've already peaked or anything like that, but it's, you know, you got to take a little break here. And they're seeing that the space is, is calming down a little bit. Perhaps it did get ahead of itself. Again, that could be a scarcity factor, but um, there is still, as, as Henri was saying, this is now going to get more specialized and, and the type of investors are going to be, as you said, Anna, 
ones that would have a, a sort of an affiliation to the actual drug or, or, or indication you're trying to address, right? It's, it's more of an impact investment versus, um, versus let's play the latest uh, trick here. And I also think that there's already a big group of people in the world that donate money on a, on a charity basis to these foundations that invest already, regardless of if it's going to be a public stock or not. And now the idea will be to transition that money to a public company or a company that would go public eventually. And it's not much of a change. It's, it's just trying to find those types of investors because they're not very um, you know, visible. They like to remain behind the scenes when they're giving their money away to help causes and things. So that's what I feel. And so, you know, people are always asking about it. They And there's still a lot of uncertainty about psychedelics. There are people that don't know anything about it, which is great because it means there's still a long way to go. But in terms of the drug development side of things, that's not really going to be impacted by the latest frenzy in the space, I think. Um, right. that, that, that client base will be, they'll be there to figure things. They know what they're doing in terms of their investment. It's, it's basically helping humanity versus making an investment to make money. Um, you know, before I get into some of the audience questions, the one thing I do want to ask you all, because I think our, a big part of our audience in this sector is is an audience that was attracted by the cannabis sector. So I, I, I need to address it, although they are very separate, um, you know, in, in where they stand within our society. Um, maybe each of you could just touch on before I go through the questions. Is there anything that we learned in the cannabis space that we should carry over to this space? Josh, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. Um, and, you know, I almost say this as, as an investor more than a lawyer, but, you know, not to get caught up in the frenzy. Um, I mean, that, that's kind of the, the biggest lesson from the investor standpoint is, you know, it's, it's very easy to get caught up. It's very easy to see psychedelic as similar to cannabis because they're both scheduled substances, at least in the United States. But that's kind of where the similarities mostly end. I mean, obviously, cannabis has got a, a, a plant medicine basis as well, and it's a big one. Um, but in terms of the public companies, it's somewhat overshadowed uh, by the recreational. Um, and that's you know, not, not really the case from the psychedelic front. Aaron? Yeah, I just echo that sentiment. There is, there's a long life cycle to these companies effectively commercializing uh, successful assets that are going to find a uh, real world application. I think the other point to remember around this too, and this was a point that Bill was making before, is that there is an inherent double bottom line to these companies. They are trying to drive, uh, you know, social change and uh, you know, help alleviate some of the, you know, significant health problems that we do have out there. So I, they're probably the two core things that, um, you know, I'd sort of ask people just to sort of focus on and think a little bit, a little bit more about deeply. Perfect, Marie. Um, I'd say, yeah, don't, don't believe the hype. Um, look for some kind of commitment from the company. I think one clear thing to look at as the psychedelic market expands is when did the company start operating? If you look at cannabis, people just kept pouring into them, that market with new, slightly changed versions of somebody else's business model. If you see a psychedelics company that formed last week, probably they're trading on the hype. If, if they can trace their lineage back two years, three years or more, you've got somebody that's got a general, a genuine commitment to the space and they are much more likely to see, succeed than a copycat. That's a really valid point. Any final uh, notes there, Bill? I would just, I would just say that uh, don't, uh, Make sure you remember what happened in cannabis. That's all. You can make money in the frenzy for sure, but like, don't forget what happened eventually. And fundamentals will always prevail. So it's foolish to say avoid these stocks because I look foolish when the stock goes from five cents to a dollar. But <laughs> when you're seeing it go that that route and that fast, just remember, to don't be the last man standing kind of thing unless you're prepared to, you know, suffer. <laughs> <laughs> Or when, who knows? Um, Further to Bill's point, though, really sure. quick, I mean, people need to look at the volume traded in these stocks because, in terms of going from you know five cents to a dollar and back down again, it takes a lot less if there's only a hundred thousand shares trading a day. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a valid point. Um, okay, so I'm gonna direct this question. So we're gonna go into Q&A. There's been so many questions coming through here. Um, so thank you so much for everyone participating in your and piquing uh, your curiosity in the sector. Um, I think this is a really good question to define and Henri, I'll, I'll direct this to you. Um, how would you break out industry in type of companies? So clinical, drug development, et cetera. Okay, uh, this is actually fairly straightforward. So the, the bulk of the industry is drug discovery. Atai is probably the most advanced, certainly the largest version of that model. Um, those are companies that will take a compound or more than one compound through clinical trial pathways. Um, and depending on how long they go through that process, the bigger the eventual exit will be. Then you've got clinics. Um, those could be bricks and mortar clinics, or they could be protocols, technologies, other things that let you retrofit existing clinics. Um, the third category, and I think it deserves a category of its own, is addiction treatment, whether that is a specific compound or it's an addiction program like Clear Sky Recovery in Mexico, or one of the well-known addiction programs. Then you've got uh, nutraceuticals and nootropics, um, which are psychedelics light. Um, they're not, you know, pharmaceutical remedies. They're designed to be sold as supplements. And they're either mild um, treatments for something or in the nootropic field, they're designed to improve the brain. So if you think about um, West Coast tech people microdosing, that is a sort of nootropic use of psychedelics. It's, there's no underlying condition. It's about you know, improving what you've already got. And then finally, you're going to have ancillary businesses, whether that's a mood monitoring app, a clinic onboarding program, patient data program, specialist insurance for clinics, debt to do real estate for clinics. There will be its own kind of ancillary ecosystem in a very similar way to you saw in cannabis. And those, I think those four or five categories are the key subsectors currently. Well, thank you. That was very well said. And I think that little clip right there can can give people a real place to start, you know, as they're looking into it. Um, Aaron, I might jump to you for this next question, just because I know that you guys invest on a global scale. What is your thought on, um, you know, as a plant based system for legalization? Do you see that coming down the pipeline for us? Uh, I, I think that there'll be an increase increasing uh, sentiment or shift towards it. I think there are different policy drivers uh, behind that, um, particularly within the United States too. I think it'll take a little bit of time to effectively evolve as a matter of public discourse. But um, it is it is something that's being tabled for discussion. There are some ballot initiatives in Oregon and a variety of other places that are occurring at the moment. But um, I think for the time being, we're still a, pretty, we're a long way off that effectively occurring. I, and I'm personally asking that not in a recreational state, but it, it really does sound like the applications of this are, are quite revolutionary. So, you know, hopefully um, different jurisdictions start to take that approach. Yeah, with, I, I think one of the, the critical gating items here is actually getting um, scientific or regulatory clearance from a, a general oversight body like the FDA that these things have sort of passed um, uh, pathways of testing and we're still a few years effectively off that despite the fact that there is a lot of, a lot of, sort of academic inquiry into these compounds at the moment but they need to be adjudicated safe and, uh, in administration across larger patient populations. Well, well, I have you speaking Aaron there is another question that came in wondering if Ate would ever consider going public if that's in your in in potential future <laughs> steps for you guys. Um, I uh, so I, I am a lawyer by trade. Unfortunately, I know that I can't. Um, I, can't <laughs> well, I know. I was just going to say, maybe question. you're not allowed to answer that. <laughs> yeah, I, unfortunately, I can't. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, we are running out of time here, so I'm just going to look through here and see if there's um, any other questions that we can that we can touch on. Um, one person brought up: Will we see SPACs? Um, will we see you know psychedelics come to the SPAC world? I think almost certainly. I mean, you know, go ahead. If you're oh, yes, definitely. I mean, we're already uh, talking to um, a fairly substantial SPAC operator. They are very interested in this. Um, and I think they'll be an integral part of the market. It's still relatively early. 
um, but they are already looking and um, having the right kind of conversation. And just for those who don't know, SPAC is a special acquisition corporation. Um, typically, they are funded, heavily funded, um, at point of entry. I, I can't remember the exact number. I believe it's 40 million is, is their requirement. So um, sorry, excuse me if I'm wrong there. Um, and, and essentially, they're built um, with the purpose of the management team to go out and acquire assets um, and consolidate within the sector. Um, and and the SPACs traditionally have been something that's happened more in the US than Canada. We're starting to see it now. Um, um, you know, and we're starting to see some of these funds come together. And I think, I think from my personal perspective, we definitely will only because, um, you know, there's just so much money that's being raised in it. Bill, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree, but I think it's, it's still pretty early in the, in the space to, you know, to consolidate anything like that or create big businesses. It's, it's very fragmented and, and, um, you know, maybe you create a giant drug development company, but I don't know. Uh, I don't see that yet. What would be such a big use of capital like that? 40 million is on the, on the low end of SPACs, from what I, from what I understand. So um, at the moment, I, I, I hear it's coming, but I don't see it being useful at the moment in the, in the space. Yeah, it would have to be something like a SPAC with a plant medicine thesis, where they could make the investment along with investments in the cannabis space. Um, there are a number of SPACs that are looking at the cannabis space and quite honestly having trouble finding places to put money right now because they, they tend to be you know, hundreds of millions, not, not tens of millions. Right. Yeah. All right, I'm going to end off here with uh, one final question because I think this is of interest to a lot of people and, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, you guys are such a pleasure to speak with. I can't thank you enough. Uh, you know, it's been great to get to know you. Um, we will ensure that people have access to get in touch with you if they have questions, but, um, you know, these gentlemen are definitely experts in their area. Uh, the one question that does come up a lot is, and, and any of you can jump in here, is will Big Pharma come into this sector? Will we see them come in or will this remain, you know, kind of on the smaller scale? They're already in. Are they already in? <laughs> Are they? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, John, they don't talk about it a lot. Johnson Johnson, the classic example, they've launched Sprabato. I think it's apparent that they're going to have to look at this sector very seriously, mostly because a lot of their investment into these kind of mental health drugs has declined they've been embroiled in scandals. There is a perception that, that that task of solving the mental health crisis, whether it's opioids or treatment resistant depression, all these conditions, the pharmaceutical industry has failed, particularly over the last few years. And to change that, they will have to look to psychedelics. Um, I think to make um, I'm going to offer a contrary opinion here. So the there has we been are going to have to wrap up in about 30 seconds. So okay. Aaron, this is the last uh, thought of the last, day. La last thought of the day. Um, I think as a result of the pandemic, we've seen um, our reliance upon those who are, um, those entities developing vaccines, therapies, and various treatments across a variety of our diseases and disorders. Uh, you know, we have a reliance on these entities. I think there's been a perception shift, even though they've had significant failings. In the past, I do think that there will be, um, they will come into the psychedelics field. And in fact, they have. I mean, there's Johnson and Johnson and Otsuka who are, um, you know, sort of both have stakes within um, sort of psychedelic like entities. Thank you so much, gentlemen. James has come on to lead us to our next uh, event. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. All right. Thank you. That's right. There's more. Thanks, oh, Anna. Great you. job, everyone. And um, you know that there's only uh, six sessions today. That was the first. So uh, we're going to give you a link on the screen that can get you right into the next session. We'll be there in about five to six minutes. Um, I also posted it in the chat. Go to CSE TV in the link above too. Uh, we're going to release all these sessions for everyone to uh, digest afterwards because there's a lot to unpack. Um, once again, thank you everyone, everyone for tuning in. We're going to see you all day, obviously. So um, without further ado, I'll send the link now. I'm going to log off and then you're going to see Anna again on the next session with some new guests with some new insights. Thank you. Thank you again, Jens. Thank gents. you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.